Hello and good morning or good afternoon, whatever time it is that you're joining us. We are thrilled that you're here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Julie and I are excited to have with us our guest today, Neil St. Clair. Neil joins us from Be Generous, one of our amazing sponsors. So glad to have them. Neil is also the co-founder and the COO of this organization. We're going to learn more about him and the organization. So Neil, stay with us. We got a few more things to, uh, to share before we jump into conversation. But Julie and I are always honored to have these conversations with rock star talent and leader across, leaders across the nation. Julia Patrick joins us as the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. As I pull for my glasses, they're never far. They're here, and I'm totally ready to nerd out. Have to say thank you to our amazing presenting sponsors that keep this show going and growing. If you've been watching, this is old news, but we're coming up on our 700th episode this month. So later this month um, and next year, we already have quite the lineup for 2023. Yeah. We could not do this without our amazing sponsors. So a huge shout out to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, where Neil's joining us from, your part-time controller, staffing boutique, nonprofit thought leader, and the nonprofit nerd. Thank you for your generosity, your trust, your investment in these conversations and ourselves as we move forward. And hey, if you missed any of our episodes, you know where to find us by now, Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, Vimeo, and wait, there's more, just like a good old ShamWow commercial. You can listen to us on the nonprofit show wherever you stream your podcast. So do tune in and listen to that. Uh, Julia, I still still hear from people that, you know, they jump on to listen one episode and then four hours later, they're still listening. So I love to hear that. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. that just says that we're, we're producing some great content out there. So uh, Neil, we are excited to have you again. For those of you watching or listening, Neil St. Clair, he is the co-founder and the COO at Be Generous. Welcome, my friend. Well, thank you very much, Jared. Uh, thrilled to be here and uh, making my first appearance. Hope it's not the last. No, we need to be getting you more and more. I mean, you kind of disclosed in the green room chatter that you had a little bit of broadcasting history um, and talent in there. So Jarrett and I glummed onto that right away. So we know you're our new best friend. Hey, um, before we get going, and we have so many questions to ask you because this is such an important topic as we speak today in December of 2022, but talk to us about Be Generous. It's such an interesting concept. You are one of those co-founders. Can you kind of give us the journey that, that brought you here? Yeah, I've basically been with Be Generous uh, from day zero. Um, so in short, Be Generous is the affirm, the Klarna, the afterpay for charitable and philanthropic giving. So where they're buy now, pay later, we're donate now, pay later. And of course, we allow donors interest and fee free to pay their donations off over time. But the nonprofit gets all of that money immediately up front to go out and do the good work in the world. Um, the quick story of how I came to be generous. So Dominic Combs, who's our CEO, and I have known each other for many, many years. We're both members of a next gen philanthropy group called Nexus. We knew each other socially. He was also on the board of a child sexual abuse prevention nonprofit, of which I was the president. That company was a client of his organization called Giving. And I also my small family foundation on there as well. So we knew each other operationally. And we had always kind of said, you know, we're ever business single one day. Why don't we maybe try to get together, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, That's fabulous. Fabulous. And that uh, that opportunity presented itself almost exactly two years ago. Um, Dom called me up. Uh, he loves when I tell this story and basically said, all right, Neil, what do you know about buy now, pay later? And is it honestly more than most? I've been looking in that space to start my next crazy thing on a entrepreneur by background and took that little turn into nonprofits as well. And so I walked him through my knowledge. He said, all right, I'm going to pitch you an idea for a company, a company that is now Be Generous. And at the end of this conversation, if you're in, you're in, right? There's no, I'll think about it tomorrow. I need an answer right now. Mm -hmm. And if you are in, then your tool's down on everything else at a small consulting firm at the time. And oh, by the way, I need you to do it for six months of no salary and all on sweat equity. Right. Um, at the point at which my, my wife then walks in and is like, sweat equity, what's, what's this all about here? And I kind of... <laughs> I kind of promised her I wasn't going to do that anymore. And I kind of look at her and she had listened to the pitch and I was like, do you mind? And she said, no, this, this, this is a good one. Um, and it's been great. You know, Dom and I have been partnered on this now with our third co-founder for, like I said, two years, and it's been a rocket ship. Um, it has just been one of the fastest growing 
uh, startups that I've ever had the honor to be a part of. And the nice thing is it's one of those not, you know, startups that allows me to sleep at night, right? Yeah. I'm not making rich people richer. Uh, I'm not putting people into loans for TVs that they can't afford. I am really materially doing some good in this world, which has been my raise on Detra since day one, which is to marry profit and purpose. And so I'm pretty thrilled to be here. Awesome. Well, this is amazing. Thank you. Um, I too was wowed by Dom and the entire platform of Be Generous. Uh, joined you guys as a trusted advisor. So full transparency and disclosure there. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love what the platform allows. I'm all in for innovation, a little bit of disruption too. And I feel like that's what you're doing, but that's a compliment. I love it. I love that. And, um, you know, for those of you listening, there's also an end of year campaign right now that Be Generous is participating in or actually supporting. So check them out. Uh, it's really important that you do so. But let's get uh, right into the thick of this, Neil, because there is so much going on right now, you know, in our, our global community. Uh, I consider myself a local globalist because what I do right here in my neighborhood, I believe impacts the entire world, right? So talk to us about what you're seeing in current donors as well as giving trends right now. Yeah, so a couple of different things. I think everybody was correctly fearful of the, the twin R's of recession in Russia. What was that going to do with the instability that we were seeing? A little political instability, prices were rising, inflation was out of control, who knew? Now, I would say, generally speaking, giving is a pretty strong lagging indicator to the broader economy. So even when the economy goes down really far, like it did in 2008, giving a never goes down as far as, it, as the rest of the economy and typically lags pretty far behind. What we're seeing right now is a pretty robust amount of giving going on. And it's not just the billionaire class or the corporate class trying to get their tax breaks. It's your average people. I think you're seeing a maturation of the millennials and the Gen Zs who, myself being a millennial, um, do, I think, have a very strong philanthropic bent. They think of themselves a little bit differently, and they are now in a position to get into that treasure part of the equation. But historically, when you look at millennial giving trends, I think the last number I saw was 80% of millennials, and this is somewhat true for Gen Z as well, consider themselves philanthropists, even though only about 20% have actually ever given a dollar to a nonprofit organization. But now as millennials enter into their 30s and so forth and so on, they are getting into that treasure part of the equation. I would say, you know, just look at Miami Giving Day. Uh, which was just a couple of weeks ago, it was a record amount of donations, if that's any kind of leading indicator. Now, Miami might just be a little bit of a microcosm um, because of the crypto factor and a lot of wealthy folks moving down. Um, but I think you are seeing that giving is not experiencing the headwinds that everybody expected overall. I think Giving Tuesday was similarly robust to years past. And I believe we'll see that through the end of the year. You know, gas prices are coming down. Inflation is getting under control. The political situation seems a little bit more stable. All these things that can make people a little more nervous to reach into their wallet. Um, and I think we're uh, going to see a really robust giving season and a happy holidays for all of us in the nonprofit world. I love that you tied these things together because it is critical for, I think, the nonprofit sector to look beyond just what our internal mission, vision, and values are. We must understand what the ecosystem is of our donors and we talk about this all the time you know um, know your donor have a relationship with your donor understand your donor but the reality is we need to kind of take that trajectory to the larger ecosystem so that we can understand more fully what our donors are experiencing you know absolutely this is you know this is table top economics kind of 101 right yeah. people are talking with their spouse about the ways that they're giving. I just had a conversation with my wife about our giving plans for this year. You know, these are the kinds of things that I think nonprofits, and I, I worked in the nonprofit world at a child sexual abuse prevention nonprofit, but I've also always worked in the private sector as well. So I've rotated through both of those. And I think many nonprofit folks who have only ever worked in the nonprofit space are shocked when yeah. someone won't make a donation. Because what we're doing is so great and amazing and we're saving lives, we're saving children, we're saving animals, whatever it is, how could you not donate? And why aren't you giving your software away to me for free? It makes no sense, right? And I even fell into that trap when I was working and running this nonprofit where I would often be like affronted. Wait, you want to you right. charge me for your donation management platform? It's crazy. Right. But the reality is there is a for-profit side of this ecosystem. And of course, there are also these microeconomics happening in households that I think you do need to understand those broader trends. And that will make the way that you make your ask a little bit more impactful. And you have to be sensitive to that because 
everybody's making those calculations around the kitchen table right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and the kitchen table is is virtual, right? It's remote. So many people are nomadic. I just shared about my goal of becoming nomadic more and more. Uh, and then we talked a bit about, you know, digital versus hard copy because, you know, Q4, we've trained our society, Neil, and you know this, that this is our giving season, you know, October, November, December. This is when we expect, you know, the majority of the operating dollars for our, our 1.8 million nonprofits to receive their funding. You had shared a stat, and I'd love for you to nerd out with us on this. Um, you know, how many gifts come in through the digital platform, which Be Generous is, versus something like a direct mail appeal, a solicitation, you know, uh, the envelopes that we're always waiting for. And I remember, Julia, back at, you know, it's like, okay, someone had to be in the office December 31st because it had to be stamped and, you know, all yeah. of that. So. So Neil, take us away with this digital versus, you know, your USPS. Yeah. So uh, most of the folks on this uh, know it's a $500 billion a year industry, more or less 1.7 million nonprofits, more than 200 million people donating just in America every single year. Still only depending on who you ask as low as 12%, as high as 20%, that's the number of donations that are given purely digitally. Right. So out of that 500 billion, at most, it's 20 percent. And it's realistically probably in the 12 to 14 percent range. Mm-hmm. Now, that digital transformation was somewhat accelerated by COVID because you know yeah. people weren't in the office at that point, but right. not so much, say, compared to the e-commerce trend, which went up from like 20 or 30 percent of all retail transactions through e-commerce. It left up like 15 percent mm-hmm. during COVID. That was a major digital transformation. Those gone back down a little bit. Now, I will tell you that that transformation to digital online giving is rotating, again, depending on who you ask, anywhere between 2 and 4% per year. I'm going to give you a pretty morbid statistic, so please don't be offended, but that number maps to one other very clear statistic, which is the death rate in America. And if you actually look at, say, cord cutting, for example, where generally older people still have their cable, there's also a similar trend of digital transformation about three to 4% per year. As that older person passes away and younger people are coming into their wealth, that transformation occurs with that pattern. And the same is true of giving. Um, it's not a perfect one-to-one, but it's, pr- it's pretty close. So the reality is, while it's still effective, although I personally don't love mailer campaigns because I think they can be quite expensive, but if you've got that flow and you know that that little old lady is going to get that envelope, it's just going to write that you know check for 75 bucks, well, the ROI is pretty clear there. Yeah. But it's you do have to take one risk as a nonprofit organization, which is to start recognizing that millennials and Gen Z are going to become your primary donor base, but probably within the next five to 10 years. And we, and I say we, cause I'm a millennial live in digital space. Yeah. I genuinely don't know the last time that I even like checked my mail. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, like, it's not, it's not, I, I don't expect to get anything in the mail other than unwanted solicitations. Right. So it's still an effective pathway but you've got to start thinking of digital transformation because that number I think is going to start to J curve up very rapidly. And you're going to start to see not 14% of giving being done online, but probably north of 50% within the next five to 10 years. So along with that, because I, I think that that's a message that we have really been you know, talking about in these three years. Um, but now I want to throw in another kind of conundrum and that is, Will donors try new portals when there's this economic, dare I say, fear or uncertainty? Um, Or does that envelope that comes in the mail seem a little bit easier to, to, to tolerate? Yeah, so I would say for your older donor that's set in their ways, and when I, when I say an older donor, let's say that that's somebody that's maybe, you know, nearing towards retirement. I don't give a specific age because, you know, it's all about mentality. Yeah. Those folks probably Thank you. Try. <laughs> they're probably not going to try new modalities. And that's not even due to economics. That's just due to, you know, Pattern. not wanting to go in that's habit and not wanting to go in and, and learn a whole new system. Right. Mm-hmm. My parents are, are a great example of that. They're in their early seventies. My dad still writes a check to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center who cared for my mother for many years. And he gets the little mailers and that's the way that he's going to give. And he's not going to change that. He doesn't need to. He doesn't want to. I mean, they still balance their checkbooks. I I don't know the last time I actually looked at my checkbook, right? Like it doesn't exist. Um, So the the simple reality is younger donors who are always, you know, easier adopters and evangelists are going to do things like 
cryptocurrency. They're going to pay out of their Apple wallet, right? When they go to do a digital transaction, uh, there are a lot of opportunities with that sub 45 year old set who are definitely open to new ways of giving. And let me throw another couple of statistics out of you. When you're dealing with the younger sub 45 audience, we are an audience that grew up in the shadow of 9-11. We grew up in the crucible of 2008 financial crisis. And we obviously just dealt with COVID. So I don't want anyone calling millennials snowflakes anymore. We've been through the soup here, right? Let's be clear. But, you heard it first. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> but now let me throw another stat at you. On top of those sort of major events that have obviously curtailed our ability to economically grow wealth and even intergenerational wealth. Over the last 40 years, real income has gone up 4% on an inflation adjusted basis. Yeah. At the same time, the consumer price index, inflation adjusted has gone up 400%. Mm -hmm. It has never been more expensive to be an American than today, right now. And by the way, the CPI just takes into account sort of a basket of goods. It doesn't take into account things like getting a mortgage, right. paying off student loans, right? Really? Right now, two thirds of all millennials that are making more than $100,000 a year, two thirds of millennials making more than $100,000 live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. They do not have extra money to give away. And so if you wanna start dealing with that next generation, you have to start breaking up those modalities, whether it's recurring gifting, you know, little you know, chill for a second, something like be generous where you're able to pay over time, allowing them to give through different types of things like cryptocurrency. You've got to start meeting your donors where they are because the reality is there are structural economic differences between the sub 45 year old set and the generation previously who has that extra capital or might have that intergenerational wealth. So it is a change of mindset. And as we know, I love and care for the nonprofit space. We're not always at the the forefront and the vanguard of change. But if you want to survive as an organization, you need to do this and take a look at the American Red Cross, United Way. Mm -hmm. They started accepting crypto pretty early. There's some great innovators at these various organizations. So, you know, fo follow the leader style here and start uh, you know, leaning into those trends if you want to survive for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Neil, I love that you said we, because I barely squeak into that sub 45 and I just want to just want to own that for the time that I can, because it's not going to last long. <laughs> um, so devil's advocate, I, you know, there's so many portals, Neil, we know this. Um, there's so many passwords. There's so many two factor, you know, authentication. I can never say that word right. Um, like the last thing I want is another login, another password, um, because I'm just, I just feel like everything's online. It is, I, you know, I'm paperless as well. Um, I, I don't get much into the, my mailbox. If I do, it's addressed to Mr. Jarrett Ransom, which definitely tells me they have no idea who I am. Right. Um, so talk to us about this devil's advocate of too many things online. And maybe we're just overwhelmed with the amount of online everything that we're doing because I'm feeling it. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. So it's what I like to call the Baskin Robbins dilemma, right? When I have 31 flavors, I got 31 flavors. So I'm actually now sclerotic because I, I can't make a choice. There's too much choice, right? But I could choose between vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, right? Yeah. So sometimes limiting that down. Now, I would also say sometimes when everybody is going in one direction, right, you may want to go the other direction. I often call this the salmon analogy, right? If you want to, yeah. Well, everyone's swimming upstream. If you don't want to get eaten by the bear, go the other way. Somebody else pointed out to me that then you can't spawn either. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting trade-off, right? So you got to make those decisions. But bottom line is, I think, you know, in a world that is highly digital with all these passwords, it's not the worst thing in the world sometimes to test out with that younger audience. Does a mailer stand out a little bit more? Now, I'm going to tell you probably no, because most millennials are going in and just chucking things out. What millennials and that younger generation, what we love, we love in-person gatherings. We love getting together with people. We love having reciprocity and feeling more involved with the charitable organization than just writing a check. So again, it's all about meeting donors where they are. And the reality is where we are, we live online. Hit us up on, you know, not even Facebook anymore, right? Hit us up, not even to an extent on Instagram anymore. Instagram is kind of losing some traction. Hit us up on Snapchat. Hit us up on TikTok. Get comfortable with these new modalities and also get comfortable with the fact that the science of donor marketing and donor acquisition is now gonna become an art form that you have to change over every probably two years at, 
at Absolutely. least, right? right? And I think a lot of folks right now are just like, well, this is the way I've done it for 20 years. It's like, that's just not the new normal. Facebook has been around for 20 years, but the reality is people aren't really utilizing that as their primary social media network anymore. It's not the place where they're learning. So yeah, you've got- a certain subset will. And, uh, and you're right. Like, you know, we're all online. It's all digital. Our children have been raised online too. Um, and that's where we find our, you know, our, our information. Um, so it, it's very telling kind of where we're going. So looking at the future, Neil, we always, you know, like to inquire, especially as we're, you know, soon to flip the the calendar yeah. into 2023, um, pull out that crystal ball. I, I have a feeling you have one, Neil, right next to you. Shine it up. And you shared a little bit about, you know, the forecasting of, of our philanthropic space. What what else, what else do you share in your crystal ball forecast for those watching and listening today? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to leap back on that last question, one other really important yeah. point. If you read the FIS World Pay Study, now they're focused mostly on merchants and retail and e-commerce. But for each additional checkout option that you give someone in digital space, you can usually add another one to 2% of yep. additional revenue transactions being completed. So yep. yes, don't give everyone 50 options, but do add those additional options because the reality is you will lose a donor if you don't offer the way that they want to pay, right? Just won't stop. So that's you just- know, an you, just, you blew my mind because I do online grocery shopping, very busy, right? And I'm like, the last thing I want to do, I do not enjoy walking through the aisles at grocery stores. Some people do, I don't. Um, so I do online groceries. And then it does say in that you know suggestion, right before I check out, we've noticed that these are some of your regular items. Would you like to add any of them into your cart? And I'm like, yes, I need bananas. <laughs> so basically they upsold me. And I think if we can take that retail merchant mentality into our donor platforms and portals, that I think will up level um, and, you know, our, our donations. A hundred percent. Don't be afraid to learn from the private sector. They're experimenting in other ways, but really focused on consumer behavior, which has parallels to donor behavior. At the end of the day, it is just, it's psychology, right? Yeah. And so leaning into that makes sense. Well, so now let me give you some crystal ball trends. I don't know the lottery numbers. I don't know who's going to win the World Cup, but I will give you some uh, some bold predictions here. Um, I will tell you that I think the acceleration of digital, as I've already mentioned, is likely to increase and perhaps even exponentially so as the older generation you know, is now getting more on a fixed income. They don't have discretionary income, they're dying off. That younger generation, which is a very different generation, is going to start coming into the forefront and they're already there to a certain extent. It's a missed opportunity to not pay attention to them. Now, I will tell you on another side, I don't know that the crypto giving trend is going to be a sustainable as people think it is. Um, I think that it will always be there. And I think there's going to be one or two major market leaders. But I would say at the same time that crypto is going through some major changes right now. And I don't know if that's going to be the most effective long-term investment for you overall as an organization. If you're a bigger organization that can make that quick investment, there are a lot of crypto folks out that are looking for a great tax haven. Yeah. Um, but is that an investment that you as a smaller, medium-sized organization should be making, You know, looking out five, 10 years? Can't say for sure, but I've, I've been a long-standing crypto skeptic. Um, I've not invested in it. And I would say, you know, and this is going to make me a, a lot of enemies in Miami <laughs> where we are very crypto friendly, but um, I don't believe that that is something that is going to be a, perhaps a very long-term giving trend for smaller organizations that, you know, it's a large investment of, of time and treasure. I do think that you're going to see an acceleration of the digital wallet. So right now it used to be PayPal right, that you would go and you would check out. And PayPal still does about $19 billion a year in transactions that are nonprofit process, you know, payment processing. They'll still be a market leader in that regard. But I think what you're gonna see, this you know, speaks to that previous point about giving options. If you're an iPhone user, you're gonna wanna check out with your Apple Pay. Yeah. It's quick, it's efficient, it's simple. Same with Google Pay, Amazon Pay, and so forth and so on. I see a lot of nonprofits that do not offer that. And I will tell you, I will make a, a guarantee that what you will see of that 65% digital drop-off, that abandoned shopping cart rate that nonprofits experience, it's because at the point of transaction, right. at the point of donation, I've now got to go get my credit card, right. and I've got to type it in, and I'm, you know, as a younger person, I haven't done that for a while, right? All my stuff's already saved and stored. And so being able to offer that, it sounds like a small change, 
but it's actually quite material because that's the way that you know millennials and younger folks transact. That idea of having a piece of plastic that you've got to go and type in is anathema. So I would say that leaning into those major trends of the idea of digital digital wallets and digital payments is something that all nonprofits and donor management platforms really need to lean, lean into. Mm-hmm. And then as a final point, you know, 80% of millennials, and this maps to Gen Z as well, and likely, you know, m- my children's generation, the so-called Gen Alphas, 80% think that they are philanthropists. That's a very specific yeah. word, right? Yeah. Philanthropist yeah. is a very specific word. But... 20% have only ever given a dollar to a nonprofit organization. Philanthropy is taking on all sorts of different shapes and forms. It's about giving time, in-kind gifts, things like that. It is taking on new shapes. Now, all of us that live in the nonprofit world, we know the treasure side of the equation is incredibly important for us to go out and do the good works that we need to do. But you do have to start thinking about some of the ways that maybe you can operationally lean out a little bit by leaning into the philanthropy side and mentality of that younger generation who frankly, because of the systemic economic reasons I laid out earlier, may not have the cash to give today, yeah. right? And so that can be a really material change. So those are some trends that I'm, I'm seeing right now, but I would say I'm a, I'm a, a big uh, ballyhooer for uh, giving overall. I think that we're gonna see a continued increase in nonprofit giving and a more charitable American going forward. So, you know, I, I have a lot of you know, good faith and a lot of upside I see as uh, our industry continues to, to grow. Wonderful. Amazing. You know, I've loved your comments. I mean, uh, I, I think it's been super powerful to have the economic ecosystem discussed in relationship to how we operate, you know, our nonprofits. And so it's really been a pleasure to have you on. For those of you who um, were following us uh, from our marketing this week, um, you might have expected to see somebody else, Dominic Calm, who we had, who we have had on. Um, he was traveling and got stuck somewhere in an airport. Neil St. Clair jumped in like within minutes. And uh, so this has really been powerful because um, Jared and I know that you had to respond very quickly. And when you can uh, articulate what you have with us and our viewers and listeners today, I, I think it's even more powerful because you didn't have time to script this. You really engaged with us in a manner um, that was true and, and immediate. And so I want to give you a shout out, Neil, for that because it was super powerful. Again, Neil St. Clair, co-founder and COO of Be Generous. Um, They're one of our new sponsors. Jared and I don't take on a lot of sponsors and we don't have room for it and we don't want to muddy the situation. Um, And so this is a new partnership that we have. It's really been fun to learn more about what you're doing and your approach and and your vision of how our uh, nonprofit sector can work and can grow. So check out BeGenerous.com. Super great website. Very interesting process. And I think um, the the adoption of it can really be something that is not horribly taxing for for any size of organization. And so uh, check them out, begenerous.com. Again, we want to thank ourselves. Hey, right, Jarrett? Jarrett R. Ransom. (laughs) Jarrett R. Ransom, uh, CEO of the Raven Group. I'm Julia Patrick, uh, CEO of American Nonprofit Academy. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors. You know, Jarrett, we were talking about this, and we haven't really addressed this too much, but, you know, our sponsors don't dictate what we talk about. It's a total laissez-faire kind of thing. And so we want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Nonprofit Nerd. Hey, I just enjoyed today so much. Really, really cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, really appreciate it. Wonderful questions, wonderful topic of conversation. Hope to be back uh, to express my, my my nerdiness with you all as well. I'm a proud nerd. It was super nerdy and I love it. We will definitely get you back on. Uh, thanks for, for jumping in the hot seat so quickly. And we have quite the lineup this week, next week. And as I mentioned, 2023 as well. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks for those of you watching maybe one of our recordings. Hope that you'll join us tomorrow. And as we end every episode, as we have every single episode before this one, We invite you to stay well so you can do well. Thanks again. We'll see you back tomorrow.